grace to you all this morning and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. And just to prepare you, I don't have anything as exciting as that for the adults. <laughs> I want to write this down. One of the secrets of life is managing your expectations. Did you get that? One of the secrets of life is managing your expectations. Now think about that for a minute. As our Jewish sisters and brothers are celebrating Passover over these days, one of the phrases that occurs again and again in their Seder meal is Dayanu, which means it is enough. If God had done just this for us, they say, that would have been enough. And yet God went, in on, went on and did more than that. And that too would have been enough. And yet God went on and did more. And that too would have been enough. But God keeps doing more and more and more for God's people. And every little thing would have been enough. And yet God does more. Managing our expectations of ourselves of other people and of God, if we could get that down, it would have been enough. And just thinking about those words today could be enough. Now, lest I've raised your expectations of the shortest sermon on record for me, <laughs> let's manage those for a minute together, shall we? <laughs> and take a breath and step back, because I have a little more to say as the Spirit guides me. As simple as the phrase sounds, it's a challenge, isn't it? To manage those expectations. To not expect something is just going to naturally be better. To not get blown backwards by life sometimes when things hit us that we either expected or didn't expect. And that too is part of our managing of our expectations. To manage those expectations of ourselves and other people realistically is probably the biggest challenge that we face. Because often we keep bringing up those same expectations over and over and over again. Any of you familiar with the Darwin Awards? Darwin Awards? Yeah, not great, right? The Darwin Awards are an unofficial award given to people who remove themselves by the, from the gene pool by doing something stupid. I mean notoriously stupid. The one that I heard about recently was of a man who, while he was walking by the side of the forest, saw an injured bear. You can see this coming, right? And he thought it would be really cool to get a selfie of himself <laughs> with the bear. And subsequently removed himself from the gene pool. And my response to something like that is, what did he expect? He was not good at managing his expectations. The bear, on the other hand, And if you look at the Darwin Awards, you see people over and over and over again whose cons the consequences of their actions make you ask, what did they expect? They were not very good at managing their expectations of what would happen given the result of certain actions. Now, you're all sitting here today, so thanks be to God, none of you wins the Darwin Award. And may you never. May you manage your expectations so well that you can understand the consequences of your actions and the actions of other people. But like I said, that's a challenge. It's really hard to do at times. And many of you are aware of the definition of insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. But that seems to be part of our human nature sometimes. Our expectations get the best of us. Our expectations are not realistic. Our expectations are not grounded in reality. And so we increasingly become vulnerable and get ourselves in trouble or other people and conflict results and sadness results and grief results. But I'm guessing that that may not be what you came to hear about this morning. So let's focus for a moment on our expectations of God. As you know, this past week, there was a horrendous fire at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And those of us who have been there, I was blessed to be there, were moved by the sacredness of that space. 
And the fire, even viewed from a distance, caused many of us to feel heartsick to see the tragedy that took place. And of course, the inevitable question that some people asked, how could God let this happen, especially during Holy Week? Really? Is that our expectation of God? Let's be honest, it is sometimes that God would intervene, that God would stop the natural course of events. Maybe not all the time, but at least for our sake, or for a greater good, we expect that of God, and then it doesn't happen, and we're disappointed, and sometimes our faith takes a major hit, and we get doubtful of God's action in human life at all. Sometimes we bargain with God. God, if you could just do this one thing for me, just this one thing, and then I'll do this for you. Any good Lutherans in the congregation who know that it doesn't work that way? That God really isn't much into bargaining with us? That we can't promise something so that God will do something for us? And yet we have that almost gut reaction inspiration to say to God, let me make a deal with you. Let it work out this way. I, I kind of knew it was a mistake this morning to check out the New York Times on my phone before worship. I try and do that so that our worship together can be relevant to what's going on in the world, but when I heard about the devastation in Sri Lanka, I thought, oh, why did I look? Why did I look? And maybe a part of me, that very human part of me, said, God, why did you let this happen on Easter Sunday of all days? But of course, Easter Sunday was the reason this happened. Because those people who wanted to cause the most harm and damage and inflict the most death knew that this would be a good day to do it. And I said, but today? And yet, what do you expect? What do you expect? Very often in our lives, because of our expectations of how we might behave or how somebody else might behave, we get caught up in that. We get really hung up on our expectations. In fact, just a couple of days ago, we celebrated what happens when people literally get hung up on their expectations. Or I should say, when Jesus got hung up on the expectations of who he would be. Literally hung up on the expectations of the people that Jesus would be the one who would come in and do the very thing we think God ought to do. Stop the suffering. Right now, despite our exercise of free will, God ought to come in like gangbusters and just change the whole plan. Now, because now is the right time for God to do that. That God will overthrow the Roman oppressors from the territory and the people could live free and worship God as they wanted. That now, at this moment in history, 2,000 years ago, God would do that. That was the people's expectation. And when Jesus failed to live up to those expectations... We failed to meet the needs of the people as they understood them when instead of bringing peace and a new order, he caused more turmoil by confronting people with the reality of God's presence. Well, he got hung up on their expectations. Crucify them. What do you expect of God? What do you expect? It's an important question. The women went to the tomb expecting what happens all the time, right? On that first Easter Sunday morning, they went to the tomb expecting that they had brought all they needed to anoint the dead body of Jesus because he was dead. That's the way it goes. Our expectations only go so far. And so the women, fully aware of their own expectations of what to find there at the tomb on this morning, come prepared to anoint the body, to prepare it because they didn't have time to do that. And they get to the tomb and the stone is rolled away. And I wonder if they thought as they were going there, well, that's convenient. Now we don't have to do it. Somebody's done it for us. That'll save us a lot of work. We can get right up to the job of anointing the body. And then they look inside, right? One of the things you'll notice if you read over the Easter Sunday accounts, Easter morning accounts in the Gospels, is that there's a lot of time that people spend looking in the tomb. 
In this one, the women look in. They don't see the body. And then later on, Peter comes running to the tomb. He looks in. He doesn't see the body either. In the other Gospels, lots of people are running to the tomb and they're looking in the tomb. And they don't see the body until they're confronted with an angel or angels who tell them, how do you love, how do you love this question, right? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? What are you doing with your head in the tomb? Is what the angels are really saying to the women. What are you looking for? What did you expect? What did you expect? And then did you notice that the two angels have to be very clear at what they're trying to communicate to the women? Don't you remember? Don't you remember what he said to you? And then all of a sudden, as that's made clear to them, their expectations are totally, totally turned over on their heads. Like, oh my gosh, of course, of course. Why didn't we see this? What did we expect? Now, we don't specifically know. Luke doesn't tell us how the women reacted. Like, he says that they ran and they told the other 11 disciples about what they had experienced there at the empty tomb. And the disciples considered it what? Remember those two words? The disciples considered it an idle tale. Now, just, I just, want, just picture this for a moment. Now that I've blown all your expectations for a short sermon, just picture this for a moment, okay? The women run to the tomb, to, like, go to the tomb to prepare the body. There's no body there. Angels tell them, it's just like he said it was going to be. It happened. And they're like, what? And they go back to the 11 disciples and they say, guess what just happened to us? You're never going to believe this. And the guys go, you're right. We don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> That's just an idle tale. You're just a bunch of crazy women who got up too early. An idle tale. Because this action of God on their part was beyond their expectations. Beyond what they can imagine. Beyond what at that moment they could even believe. Now where does this all come together in Luke's Gospel? It comes together as they hear rumor after rumor about this resurrected Jesus and still can't quite get it into their heads. It finally comes together for them when Jesus shows up and says, knuckleheads. Okay, he doesn't say that. That was my sort of... He says, look, here I am. Don't you remember? The forces of the world were arrayed against me. Death, hatred, oppression, grief, sorrow, violence, all those forces were arrayed against me. And yet, in my cross and resurrection, I have overcome them. Because it's the power of God for life. What did you expect? And that's the question that confronts us together this morning. What do you expect from God? What do you expect? Because too often what happens is, we're just like those women. We're just like the disciples who run to the tomb. Our heads are stuck in the tomb. We're looking in this other direction when God is kind of standing around us and saying, hey, there's life here. In the worst of situations, there's life because God is in it. That's the message of the cross and resurrection, that God is present and that we are called as God's people to be that holy presence to others who are hurting and oppressed and frightened and sick, that that presence of the resurrected Christ comes into the world through us, not through somebody else. That's an unrealistic expectation. Yesterday morning, almost at this time, we had the funeral here for Rosemary Bartzik, and here lay Rosemary for that service. And now Rosemary is laid to rest, and in the place has bloomed a garden. Isn't that appropriate? That where there was death, God creates life. Where there is sorrow and brokenness, God invites hope and strength and faith, and courage, and newness, and trust. That where our resources are finished, and we don't know what to do but go and celebrate the death 
God says, the tomb is empty. Life takes precedence. Or, if you'll forgive me, to quote from Jurassic Park, <laughs> life will find a way. God came up with that first, by the way. It was borrowed by the, by the script writers of Jurassic Park. Life will find a way. That's what this day is all about. So I want to help you manage your expectations. When it comes to God, God is beyond our expectations, beyond our understanding. But God is about life. God is good. And Christ is risen. And sisters and brothers, given that it's God behind all of this, and you, what did you expect?